Hello and welcome. I'm Tom Burgess Watson. You're watching W News, broadcasting live from the Al Arabiya News headquarters. These are our top stories. With just eight days to go until the US election, Donald Trump travels to Georgia after his campaign distances itself from comments made by a comedian who spoke during his New York rally on Sunday. Kamala Harris's campaign says language used at that rally was divisive and demeaning. Today, the vice president is in Michigan, reaching out to Arab American and Muslim voters. And Iran vows to use all available tools to respond to Israel's attack on military targets. The Iranian media says one civilian was killed in those strikes. Hello and welcome. With just eight days to go before the U.S. election, the former President Donald Trump is traveling to Georgia today, while the Vice President Kamala Harris is focusing her efforts on energizing the electorate in Michigan. Well, that is a state with a significant Arab American and Muslim population. Well, last night, Trump held a high-profile rally at Madison Square Garden in his hometown of New York City, where he repeatedly underscored his commitment to tightening up immigration. But it wasn't all smiles for the Trump campaign, as today it looked to distance itself from comments made by one of the speakers at that rally, as our correspondent Kate Fisher now reports from Washington. The lines outside New York's Madison Square Gardens arena are usually for music stars or big sporting events. But these spectators are queuing up for the Trump show. I came out here because I think Trump is the only presidential candidate that has the American people's best interest at heart. The former president was introduced by his wife in a rare appearance from Melania Trump on the campaign trail. But there was little unity in Donald Trump's message. On day one, I will launch the largest deportation program in American history to get the criminals out. I will rescue every city and town that has been invaded and conquered, and we will put these vicious and bloodthirsty criminals in jail. We're going to kick them the hell out of our country as fast as possible. The final days of a campaign are often when candidates try to gather as many voters as possible under a unifying message. But this rally was marked by swear words, misogyny and racist jokes. There's a lot going on. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah, I think it's called Puerto Rico. In response, Puerto Rican singer Ricky Martin posted a clip of the comments on his Instagram and wrote in Spanish, this is what they think of us. The Harris campaign also responded, and it came just hours after the Democratic presidential nominee visited a Puerto Rican restaurant in Philadelphia in the swing state of Pennsylvania. She also spoke at a church in the city, delivering her closing arguments on her case for the presidency. Because, church, I know we were born for a time such as this. And I have faith he is going to carry us forward and the road ahead won't be easy. It will require perseverance and hard work. To that end, Harris plans to visit every battleground state in the coming days, as polls show the candidates are still neck and neck in these states, which will decide who becomes the next president of the United States. Kate Fisher, Al Arabia News, Washington. Well, let's get more now. We can cross to our chief correspondent, Simon Marks, who joins us from Washington. Simon, great to have you with us. Lots of reaction to Sunday's comments about Latinos at that Trump rally, uh, which the uh, comedian uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, as we just heard there, said the US territory of Puerto Rico was a literally a floating island of garbage. How's that gone down? Well, very badly, of course, with people from Puerto Rico. And remember that this is an election in which uh, Donald Trump and the Republicans have been coveting their ability to secure more support than they've ever had before from the Hispanic and Latino community here in the United States. And so suddenly they moved into major damage limitation mode with the Trump campaign, uh, putting out a statement saying that the uh, comedian did not speak for Donald Trump, did not... Uh, 
uh, represent his views. They've let it be known that his uh, remarks at that event at Madison Square Gardens uh, were not uh, approved or screened by the Trump campaign before he got up and stood behind the microphone. But Kamala Harris and her supporters, of course, piling on and saying that what Donald Trump did at that rally yesterday, through all the various speeches, and the remark about Puerto Rico was just one of a whole series of far-right extremist viewpoints that were being presented to Trump's Make America Great Again supporters who were filling Madison Square Garden's uh, arena to the roof, uh, that all of that is the true reflection of who Donald Trump really is and of what he's planning to bring, the tone and the style of government that he wants to lead should he be returned to the White House. Uh, whether that argument or Trump's claim uh, that the comedian didn't speak for him is having any impact on the fury that those uh, comments have generated, we still do not know. But there's no question that the Trump campaign, uh, I think today, would much rather that those comments had not been made because they've certainly damaged Donald Trump's ability to persuade Latino and Hispanic voters that they are safe if they decide to back him and send him on his way to the White House. Yeah, and it's a huge demographic as well, isn't it? We're talking about sort of 19% of the electorate. Um, let's talk about what's happening today. President Joe Biden casting his ballots, and both candidates are in key battleground states. Just talk us through um, uh, the key points of today. Well, for Kamala Harris, it's all about Michigan. And that is because, for Kamala Harris, this election may end up being all about Michigan. She's making three separate appearances at three separate campaign events in the state at a time when Arab-American voters in Michigan are threatening in large numbers to desert her, at a time when the third-party candidate Jill Stein of the Green Party is making an active play for the votes of disaffected Arab-Americans who are deeply critical of the Biden-Harris administration's handling uh, of the crisis in Gaza. And interestingly, we heard from Michelle Obama, the former First Lady of the United States, for the first time on Friday, not just urging people to align themselves with Kamala Harris, particularly uh, black male uh, voters uh, who in many parts of the country say that they are still very hesitant to support the first black woman with a chance of becoming president of the United States, but all voters that Michelle Obama said might be flirting with the idea of casting a protest vote for a third party candidate. That was a message directed at the Arab American community in Michigan. Uh, and the Democrats definitely know, as we're seeing from Kamala Harris's focus on the state uh, today, that they've got a problem there. Donald Trump will be addressing a rally in uh, Georgia today, and he is preparing to tomorrow uh, to head back to Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania absolutely considered a must-win state by both uh, Donald Trump and uh, Kamala Harris. It'll be interesting to see when Donald Trump talks in Georgia uh, this evening uh, whether he references those comments that were heard at Madison Square Garden about Puerto Rico. Does he address it directly or does he continue to let his surrogates do all the talking? And Simon, I mean, it looks, doesn't it, like seven swing states are going to decide the election. Uh, that's if the uh, polls have been believed. But we are looking, aren't we, at probably one of the tightest elections of modern times. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been here a long time, Tom. This is my eighth presidential election uh, covering events uh, in Washington, D.C., invariably we get to this stage of an election and people are saying, number one, it's neck and neck, and number two, it's the most important uh, election of everyone's lifetime. I mean, the reality is this is certainly the most important election of everybody's lifetime, and in terms of the outcome, absolutely anything could happen here. Anyone who says they know how this is going to end up does not know how it's going to end up. There are models that suggest it could be a Kamala Harris landslide in the Electoral College. There are some models that suggest Donald Trump could not only win in the Electoral College, he might even win the popular vote, winning more votes nationally than Kamala Harris. So all of the polling, all of the modelling offers up 
a whole array of different possible outcomes here. Uh, and until we get through election night and see whether there is a clear winner, it's impossible to make a prediction. And if there is not a clear winner, uh, then things have the potential here to get very sticky because Donald Trump already uh, preparing to launch uh, legal action to protest uh, against the outcome of this election if he loses it. And the Democrats also, Kamala Harris conceded last week that her campaign is also lawyered up uh, ahead of any disputes that arise after election night is behind us. OK, well, thank you very much indeed for that update. Our chief correspondent, Simon Marks, in Washington. Thank you. Let's get some more analysis now. We can cross to New York and speak to Jean Le Boutillier, who's a political columnist and former Republican U.S. congressman for the New York City's sixth uh, district. And you, I understand, have endorsed Kamala Harris. Can I just start by asking you why you've decided to do that? Well, I'm, I'm one of 34 former Republican congressmen who have endorsed her. We're called Republicans for Harris because we know Trump, we know what a disaster of a human being and a president he was and would be again. And I think we're all happily uh, supporting Kamala Harris uh, because we believe she represents the good part of America, not this dark, horrible stuff we saw yesterday afternoon in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, what was the point of that event in New York yesterday? Because New York is traditionally pretty blue territory, isn't it? Very blue territory. Trump is, of course, from New York. Madison Square Garden is the iconic sports arena of all time if you're in New York. And I think Trump has wanted to do a rally there for a long time, thinking that it doesn't necessarily affect New York State, which he's going to lose but that it gets so much media attention that it would help him around the country. In fact, this thing got out of hand from the get-go. The worst instincts of all 30 speakers came out. They weren't reined in by any adult supervision. And I think that event will do more to hurt Trump next Tuesday than any single event in weeks, because it was ugly, it was nasty. How did that help him? get new voters that he doesn't already have. Yeah, it made his own base voters very happy. But that's not the point. You're supposed to keep your base and then reach out to get more voters added on. This will drive those new voters away from him. Yeah, you say you support uh, Kamala Harris. Looking at the polls, how do you rate her chances? I think pretty good. I mean, I agree with Sam, who just said, you know, anybody who says they know doesn't know, and I don't pretend to know. But I do know what we're finding from the first three weeks or four weeks of early voting. An extraordinarily high amount of Americans have already voted. Uh, about a quarter of all the voters that voted in 2020 have already voted this time. We have a week to go. It's thought that 50 to 60 percent of the vote will have been cast before Election Day next Tuesday. And out of the ones who've already voted, we do not know how they voted. We don't know that. They don't open them up and announce them until that night. But uh, we do know who's voting. And we know that women are outvoting men 55 to 45. And I believe, I can't prove it, but I believe that is Dobbs, that is abortion, that is Trump's treatment of women has motivated American female voters to come out in extraordinarily disproportionately large numbers to vote for the first woman president and to vote against Trump. And it may be more against Trump than it is for her. This is going to be uh, Trump's last shot at the presidency. That much we can be pretty sure of. He's uh, already, he can't, he can't serve a third term anyway. I just want to know, though, how different the Republican Party is under Donald Trump to the Republican Party that you knew and, and campaigned for in the past. It has, bears absolutely no resemblance whatsoever. Neither the people that are in it, the people that run it, and what they believe completely different in every way. 
And I was proud of my Republicanism when I was a congressman and I was under, I was at, elected at the same time as Ronald Reagan. And we had an overwhelmingly positive message about how to make America a happier place, a more prosperous place, and a safer place. This negative stuff that Trump propounds, that's not my party. And I hope if he loses, if MAGA loses, uh, I hope that's the beginning of the end of this movement and we can resuscitate the old Republican Party or else create a new party that offers people hope, uh, not trashing our fellow Americans, which is crazy. That's not the way to win an election. Yeah, I mean, you could say that a lot of the aggressive, personal, divisive rhetoric on both sides is somehow symbolic or, you know, em, you know uh, symbolizes the extent to which the United States is deeply divided right now. I mean, you've got uh, uh, that comedian talking about Puerto Rico as being a, a garbage dump or words to that effect. And uh, on the other side, you've got um, labels of Nazis and fascists being pinned on Donald Trump by, by the Democrats. Do, do you think there's some, you know, argument in favor of the fact that this shows just how divided America has become? It's not anything new. Uh, America is a 50-50 country. Go back to 2000, Bush and Gore. That was a absolutely 50-50 race separated by 500 plus votes in the state of Florida. And we've had close ones since. Now, one, one point that Sam, your correspondent on the previous phone call, he said, you know, every scenario is possible. Kamala could win in a landslide in the electoral college. Not likely. But then he said, even Trump might even win the popular vote. That, to me, is almost impossible. And I'll tell you why. Since 1992, the re-election, and he lost, of President George H.W. Bush, he lost that to Bill Clinton. The Republicans, beginning that year, have lost the popular vote every presidential election since, with one exception, 2004, President George W. Bush narrowly beat Senator John Kerry in the popular vote. He did win the Electoral College. The Republicans are a declining party in America. We lose the popular vote every four years. Through a fluke in 2016, Hillary won the popular vote by two and a half million votes, but lost the electoral vote in the three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. That is the lesson for Kamala Harris, not to let that happen again, to really work those three states and Georgia, North Carolina, Nevada, and Arizona. And she's working very hard. I don't think she'll repeat any of the mistakes but it will be close. I mean, that's the nature of America. We're a divided country. You're divided, and yet there is quite a lot of talk at the moment about a third party, the Green Party. For example, uh, disenfranchised voters who don't want to see either of the established parties win are talking about Jill Stein. They're talking about the Green Party. I don't know what sort of a percentage you think the Green Party could end up winning, but could it be enough, do you think, to somehow become a kingmaker party? Well, it was in 2016. Jill Stein ran again or earlier as the Green Party nominee, and we also had the Libertarian Party was quite prominent in that race. And they definitely took votes away from Hillary, and that, in effect, helped Trump win those three electoral, uh, those three states in the Electoral College. This time, the third party thing isn't really very prominent. It was originally going to be Bobby Kennedy Jr., who was for a while polling in the mid-15, 17, 18 points as a third party candidate. That disappeared. He ran out of money. He joined the Trump campaign. He's not a factor. I don't think Jill Stein will be a factor. I really don't. I think nor will Cornell West, who's the other one, a black Harvard and Princeton uh, African American Affairs professor who's running. But because she is black, uh, Kamala Harris, I don't think a black third party candidate will hurt much. I think the votes are going to go to her.
Okay. Jean Le Boutillier, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us here on Al Arabian News. Thank you. I love being with you. It's my first time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get a check of some of the other day's news stories we're following for you now. Large crowds gathered this evening outside the parliament in Georgia. This after Saturday's election, which saw the ruling Georgian Dream Party come out on top. Well, the pro-European opposition accuses the ruling party of stealing the election. Georgia's pro-Western president says the vote was rigged with the help of Russia. The NATO Secretary General Mark Rutte has expressed concern about deepening cooperation between Russia and North Korea. Speaking at a press conference in Brussels today, Rutte said a stronger relationship between Moscow and Pyongyang not only undermines peace on the Korean peninsula, but it also fuels Russia's war with Ukraine. The former Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, has testified at a Senate inquiry into drug-related killings during his administration, revealing that he maintained a death squad of uh, criminals to target other criminals while serving as mayor. Well, in his first public appearance since leaving office in 2022, the 79-year-old said he offers no apologies, no excuses for his presidency, which saw up to 30,000 deaths in the controversial war on drugs. India's megacities were covered in a thick blanket of smog today as air quality continues to pose serious threats to the health of millions of people. The national air quality marked the air quality as being very poor in many parts of New Delhi. All air pollution is expected to worsen during the Hindu festival of lights, Diwali, which falls on the 1st of November this year. And that's uh, going to see fireworks adding to the emissions. The UN says greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere have reached new record highs. Carbon monoxide, methane and nitrous oxide all hit record levels last year. Well, CO2 has increased more than 10% during the past two decades. To Japan now, where the country has been plunged into political uncertainty after the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, or LDP, and its coalition party lost their parliamentary majority in a general election. Well, the LDP has been the dominant party in Japan for most of the past seven decades. But scandals and the high cost of living have shaken citizens' confidence in the party and the future of the country's new prime minister, uh, Shiguro Ishiba, also hangs in the balance, as Rebecca Bandhan now reports from Tokyo. Calling a snap election was a decision that backfired for Shigeru Ishiba, who became prime minister just a month ago, after he won his party's leadership race. Both his future and that of the Japanese government now remain uncertain. In a press conference on Monday, he vowed to reform the party and win back people's trust. I understand that this harsh result is a harsh criticism from the public about the LDP stance on reform. I strongly believe that the seats we were given was in response to the voice the public has expressed, saying that the Liberal Democratic Party needs to be more humble, sincere and honest in its dealings with people, and that there is a lack of reflection. But some analysts believe Ishiba could be forced to resign, after the LDP and its coalition partner, the Komeito Party, only secured 215 seats in the general election, well short of the 233 majority mark. The parties had held 279 seats together. Issues including a cost of living crunch and a political fundraising scandal are factors that have dented the LDP's popularity, which had enjoyed a majority in Parliament for more than a decade. But while the main opposition Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan gained a lot of ground, the LDP still got more votes than any of its rivals. There was a lot of noise about the slush fund scandal and other political parties are working hard. But I voted for the LDP because I don't really have other parties I support. With 30 days to form a government, the LDP will need the support of other parties and its position will be weaker when it comes to pushing through some policies. The LDP will now have to look into cooperation outside their cabinet or align with opposition parties for each policy, so it will be difficult for them to operate. There may be a lot of near-term uncertainty, but some analysts say that the outcome of Japan's election is a good development in terms of democracy as the country's political landscape becomes more competitive. Rebecca Bundin, Al Arabiya News, Tokyo.
Well, let's get a check of a couple of days. Uh, top business news stories for you now. Gold prices eased today, weighed down by a firmer dollar and higher treasury yields. This is traders await a slew of U.S. economic data for guidance on the U.S. Federal Reserve's interest rate stance. Well, spot gold lost 0.5 percent, down to just under 2,733 U.S. dollars an ounce. U.S. gold futures dropped to just above 2,745 U.S. dollars an ounce. And India has launched its first private military plant. The 2.5 billion U.S. dollar aircraft factory, which is a collaboration between Spain and India through Tata Advanced Systems and Airbus. Well, Airbus will deliver the first 16 of the, of the aircraft from the final assembly line in Spain. Six of them have been delivered to the Indian Air Force so far. Meanwhile, Tata Advanced Systems will produce 40 of the aircraft in the Vadodara plant. Volkswagen plans to shut at least three factories in Germany, laying off tens of thousands of staff and shrinking its remaining plants. While the carmaker has been negotiating for weeks with unions over plans to revamp its business and lower costs. Well, talks include considering plant closures in Germany for the very first time. Well, last month, VW said it plans to end its job security program, which has been in place for 30 years. This is it faces pressure from Asian competitors. A couple of sports stories we're following for you now. Manchester United have sacked the manager, Eric Teghag. Ten Hag, who was appointed in 2022, led United to two domestic trophies, the League Cup in 2023 and the FA Cup in 2024. But his job was the subject of speculation most of last season as United suffered a worst ever eighth place Premier League finish and exited the Champions League at the group stage. While well, United's assistant manager, Ruud van Nistelrooy, will take over on an interim basis while the club looks for a new manager. Yearly ranking, some reports expect Spain's Rodiri to win over Real Madrid's Vinicius Junior. Well, in the women's category, Spain's Aitana Bonmati is slated to win for a second time in a row. Well, the coveted award show is underway as neither Lionel Messi nor Cristiano Ronaldo appear on the shortlist for the first time since 2003. Some news just into us here at Al Arabiya News. Uh, the US President Joe Biden is saying that the war in Gaza should end. Uh, we've heard that just in the last uh, minute or so. Uh, Joe Biden, the United States President, saying uh, he wants to see the war in Gaza end. So that's the latest we've got for you from uh, Washington on that. And we'll bring you more uh, as we get it. Now, staying in the Middle East, and uh, the Iranian foreign ministry is saying that Tehran is vowing to use all available tools to respond to Israel's attack on military targets in Iran during the course of the weekend. We are using all available means to respond firmly and effectively to the aggression of the Zionist regime. The nature of our response will depend on the nature of the attack. Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesperson there will answer Saturday's strikes against military sites killed four soldiers, but the attacks were more limited than had been expected. Well, earlier on today, the Iranian media reported that a civilian had also been killed in those attacks. Well, Israeli officials say the airstrikes were carried out as a direct response to an Iranian missile barrage launched on the 1st of October. And uh, that attack was in turn in response to the assassination of the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah earlier on this month. Well, for more analysis, I'm joined now by the retired British Army officer, Major General Tim Cross. Thank you very much indeed for being with us here on Al Arabian News. Um, I just wanted to ask you first, Major General, what struck you about the choices of target uh, by Israel uh, during the course of the weekend? Well, I think I was quite surprised, to be honest. Um, I think that undoubtedly it is not as big a response as I feared or expected. Um, I wasn't sure they would try and take on the nuclear assets, although I suspect that was certainly on the agenda. But certainly the oil exports and so on, I think, must have been serious consideration. But I think what it shows is that Israel doesn't want 
to engage in a major way with uh, Iran. It's got enough on its plate with Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and of course the Houthis and others. So I think it was a genuine attempt to try and draw a line under this. Now, whether Iran will see it that way is, you know, anybody's guess, really. And do you think it's got any realistic sort of impact that you would foresee on Iran's ability to defend itself, those attacks? No, although um, I think, it, it, you know, Israel does have the ability to overmatch Iran in all sorts of areas. I mean, one of the issues here is they are using up both sides, in fact, all sides <laughs> in this conflict are using up a huge amount of material, particularly, obviously, missiles um, and other weapons. So there comes a time, too, where they must be thinking about their ability to replace some of this stuff. Um, so I, I'm not sure of the, of the actual damage that was achieved by the attack itself. Um, but I do think it was a limited attack. And I think Israel does have the ability to overmatch Iran's defences if it really wanted to cause serious damage and to take the fight deeper into Iran and take on those other um, installations that they may, have, may, they may well have considered. So we're saying it's a, a limited attack and perhaps not as far reaching as, as some had thought it might be. But we don't know, do we, that it's not the only counterattack by Israel. There could be more to come, couldn't there? There could. But I, I mean, I may be wrong. I'm, I'm only giving you my sort of own, own estimate here, having clearly followed what's been going on like everybody else for quite some time. There are other ways of attacking Iran, of course, that they may be using uh, in the way that they've used elsewhere. But I think... <laughs> Although they have the ability to do it again, my instinct is they will not want to do it again um, unless Iran responds in a much greater um, you know, response than, than perhaps uh, you know, we are hoping for at the moment. If Iran does give a, a response that is you know, a serious attack and begins to target um, you know, various installations within Israel, etc., then I think Israel almost has got no option but to respond. But my, my underlying sense is that they do not want this to escalate. Now, Netanyahu has made the point that he's not, you know, under command of America, in inverted commas, that he hasn't taken them, you know, he hasn't done just this just because of what they tell him. But I don't think there's any doubt that, that America are putting pressure on him to limit this uh, because nobody wants a more generalised conflict across the Middle East. So, yeah, my, my, my sense is that they could have responded in, in a much bigger way. They decided not to and that they and Iran are hopefully are going to draw a line under this for a while anyway. Do you think from Iran's perspective, there are those who are thinking in Tehran that if we don't respond uh, to this latest counterattack, which in turn was a counterattack for another attack, it, it does go on and on and on. But if they don't do anything at this point, does that make them look weak, do you think, in front of not just the domestic well, audience, but internationally as well? Well, there's, there's, a, there's an element of that. But what, you know, what this needs is wise leadership character, integrity and, and, and moral courage to be able to recognise that tit-for-tat attacks like this are getting nobody anywhere, really. And therefore, as long as the damage to Iran was not significant, which is, I think, the case, I think they could argue that they have um, held Israel back. They can, they can spin this any way they want to spin internally and indeed externally by saying that, um, you know, they've, they've forced I Israel uh, not to respond in any great... A greater way. One of, one of my old maxims, one of my favorite maxims is by Sun Tzu, who said, if you understand yourself and you understand the enemy, you need not fear the outcome of a thousand battles. And one of the issues here is how does Israel understand Iran and how does Iran understand Israel? And leave aside, you know, the rhetoric and all the rest of it that goes on. And then I'm, I'm quite clear in my own mind, on both sides, they will be doing serious analytical conversations and discussions about how they think uh, Israel and, and, and indeed Iran will respond to all of this. And I think with wise leadership, uh, then you can draw a line. Now, you know, there is a, there is a suggestion, there is a, a view that in Netanyahu and in the leadership of Iran, it's very difficult to really understand what's going on in their minds. And certainly I wouldn't claim to understand what's going on in their minds any more than I would claim to understand what's going on in Putin's mind. But you know, they are, at the end of the day, national interest and a recognition that these tit-for-tat exchanges are not going to take them very far. I would hope uh, and pray that they will then, as I say, as we keep on saying, draw a line under this for, for a period of time. Iran's problem, of course, is what's happening to Hezbollah and what's happening to Hamas and what potentially will happen to, to the Houthis. And there's no doubt that that is a significant issue for them. 
But I don't think them attacking Israel directly is going to solve that problem. They're going to have to find a different way of, of, of reinvigorating their proxy forces in those places, plus, plus places like Syria and Iraq and so on. OK, well, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us. Retired British Army officer, Major General Tim Cross, thank you very much indeed. OK, you're very welcome. Get a quick reminder of our top stories here on Al Arabiya News. With just eight days to go until the US election, Donald Trump is traveling to Georgia today. This is his campaign distances itself from comments made by a comedian who spoke during one of his rallies during the weekend. Kamala Harris's campaign says the language used at that Trump rally in New York was divisive and demeaning. This is the vice president heads to Michigan to reach out to Arab American and Muslim voters. And Iran vows to use, quote, all available tools to respond to Israel's attack on military targets. This says the Iranian media says that one civilian was killed in those strikes. Well, that's all we have time for. Coming up next is Riz Khan, and then at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, do join us for Global News Today. That is a roundup of top international news with exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision makers. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned.